Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be with you for the next hour. I'm anxious to resume our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy back in the mid to late 1800s. If you're looking for an answer to the question, who rules the world, and what has gone, what is causing the world uh, to plunge into the depths of tyranny and war that we see today, just read this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. If you want to know what ails the world today and who's responsible for it, read this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Get a copy of it at your used bookstore and uh, read it and share it with friends. It's my pleasure and privilege and blessing to read this book on Inquisition Update. Now, the last time we were talking about the, the decree of this Dr. O.A. Brownson in his Brownson's Essays, how the papacy has the divine right to rule the world, both in civil affairs, private affairs, public affairs, and uh, spiritual affairs. And he not only has divine right supremacy over the given law, the revealed law, but he also, as we are about to find out, has divine right supremacy over the natural law. Now, we'll back up one paragraph for continuity purposes this morning, begin reading the last full paragraph on page 31 if you have a copy of this book and are reading along. Speaking of Dr. Brownson, R.W. Thompson says, he then pursues another method of reasoning, which, under the cover, uh, uh, under the color of a single concession, brings him to the same conclusions. The main object, that is, the absolute and universal power of the papacy, never being lost sight of, agreeing that the state has some authority within the limits of the law of nature, he concedes to it, that is, the civil law the right to act, quote, without ecclesiastical or church restraint or interference, unquote, when and only so long as it confines itself within the scope of that law. All right, so the civil power has some jurisdiction, and that's the natural law. But listen to what he says now. But he puts such limitations upon even this restricted right as to render it of no avail for any of the purposes of an independent government by insisting that as the papacy holds its authority directly from God and exercises it under his revealed law, which includes the law of nature, it is, therefore, the only competent judge of infractions upon both the revealed and the natural law. Speaking of the church, and since the decree of papal infallibility, he, of course, means the pope, who represents and absorbs all the authority of the church. He then says, quote, she, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, she is under God the supreme judge of both laws, that is, the revealed law and the natural law, which for her are but one law. And hence, she takes cognizance in her tribunals of the breaches of the natural law as well as of the revealed, and has the right to take cognizance by nations as well as of its breaches by individuals, by the prince as well as the subject, for it is the supreme law for both. There you have it. The Roman Catholic Church is the supreme law of the world. And it says the state is therefore only in an, an inferior court, bound to receive the law from the supreme court, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, 
and liable to have its decrees reversed on appeal, unquote. So this means that the papacy, being the divine right sovereign lawgiver of both the revealed or natural or, uh, or excuse me, civil law, and also the natural law, any government upon the earth, no matter of what sort, state, federal, or even your personal, your personal law, your conscience, the papacy may overrule. It is the Supreme Court. Now, this is the, this is the uh, uh, assertion of this Dr. O.A. Brownson. And you may find these assertions in his work entitled Brownson's Essays. And they were published by the Roman Catholic Church. And this is the mentality of the papacy, even today. One of the, you know, people are busy trying to figure out what's going wrong in the United States and the world today. And, and the assertion is clear in this book that the cause of all the world's woes is by the least suspected entity on the earth, the pla uh, on the planet. That is the papacy. As absurd as it may sound, R. W. Thompson makes the case plain as day. And that's why this book is so important. It ought to be read in every church. Now, these sentiments were not uttered from mere impulse. Speaking of these Brownson's assertions, these sentiments were not uttered from mere impulse or in the heat of animated discussion. They were carefully formed and elaborated in the closet and set forth with full deliberation and hierarchical sanction. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church sanctioned these statements. Why? To prepare the minds of the Roman Catholic part of our population for events which have since transpired and which were then doubtless anticipated. And we're talking about the decree of papal infallibility. Dr. O.A. Brownson, a citizen of the United States, an American-born citizen, became the pen that the foreign priests of Rome, the foreign educated priests of Rome, the priests of Rome who are subservient only to the papacy, have no, no filial uh, relationship to this country whatsoever, were viewed as foreigners in the country at that time, used the pen of an American-born citizen to promote the papal ideal, knowing that any Roman Catholic priest who stood up and said these things would be pelted with tomatoes. But the people patiently bore these statements from an American citizen. Now, it says they had undoubtedly the full approval of the highest authorities of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. For so wonderfully perfect is the plan of papal organization that their author would not have acquired the distinguished position he has since re he, he, he has since reached in the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, if he had ventured to commit the papacy wrongfully upon questions of so much delicacy and importance. In other words, immediately after O.A. Brownson put forth his thesis, he was immediately promoted within the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church didn't stand up and rebuke him for putting too much power into the hands of the papacy. No, they championed O.A. Brownson, a one-time Protestant, and elevated him within the Roman Catholic Church because he accomplished something in this country that no Roman Catholic priest would have gotten by with. He made the papacy the god of this world. And simply in preparation for this new doctrine that had since come about, the doctrine called the papal infallibility, and it says Dr. Brownson had prepared himself 
for the adoption of these views by previous study of the papal system and was therefore, as a native citizen, the most fit person to give them public utterance. It being very naturally supposed, no doubt, that the people of this country would silently submit to harsh criticism upon the principles of their government when made by a native. When the same criticism made by a foreigner, a foreign Roman Catholic priest, a Jesuit priest no less, would have aroused their just indignation. An intelligent and educated mind like, the, like his could not fail to see the principles he enunciated were diametrically opposed to the whole theory of American government, a government of, by, and for the people. O. A. Brownson's assertion was that a government in this world that is created of, by, and for the people is inherently heretical and rebellious against the divine right or of the papacy to rule everybody, every man, woman, and child, and even not only through the civil law, but by the natural law as well. An intelligent and educated mind like his, O.A. Brownson, could not fail to see that the principles he enunciated were diametrically opposed to the whole theory of American government and that the logical consequence of their supremacy in the United States would be the end of popular government by the substitution for it of one in the ecclesiastical form, the church form, the Roman Catholic church form. Now, he had but a few years ago announced that, quote, the Roman Catholic religion assumes as its point of departure that it is instituted not to take care, uh, excuse me, not to be taken care of by the people, but to take care of the people, not to be governed by the people, but to govern them, unquote. And from this standpoint of deadly hostility to the institutions under which he was born in this country and which allowed him the liberty he was so unpatriotically abusing, it was but a single step to such bold and audacious avowals as the following. Quote, The people need governing and must be governed. They must have a master. The religion which is to answer the religion which is able to answer our purpose must be above the people and able to command them. The first lesson to the child is obey. The first and last lesson to the people, individually and collectively, is obey. And there is no obedience where there is no authority to enjoin it. The Roman Catholic religion, then, is necessary to, to sustain popular liberty because popular liberty can be sustained only by a religion free from popular control, above the people, speaking from above and able to command them. And such a religion is the Roman Catholic. In this sense... We wish this country to come under the Pope of Rome. As the visible head of the church, the spiritual authority which Almighty God has instituted to teach and govern the nations, we assert His supremacy and tell our countrymen that we would have them submit to Him. They may flare up at this as much as they please, and write as many alarming and abusive editorials as they choose or can find time and space to do. They will not move us or relieve themselves from the obligation Almighty God has placed them under of obeying the authority of the Catholic Church, Pope and all." Unquote. There you have it. That's the thesis of Dr. O.A. Brownson. That's the thesis of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church who promoted him within the church. This is the thesis of the papacy 
This is the thesis of the Roman Catholics in our government who are imposing Roman Catholic canon law and destroying our Constitution and making our government an oppressive regime. Nothing has changed since 1876 when R.W. Thompson wrote this book. This thesis has only matured and been put more and more and more into practice until it has finally awakened the American people to discover what might be the problem in this country. But even still, almost none, as a percentage of those investigating, almost none suspect the papacy when it was known by R.W. Thompson and so many other writers during this period of time, the 1800s. This book is one of the most important books in my library. Now, the author says this. Listen to this. When Pope Gregory XVI some years ago uttered the saying, listen to this, quote, out of the Roman states, in other words, anywhere outside of the papal states, that, that small area of Italy that still came under the, the temporal uh, rulership of the papacy, he said, out of the Roman states... There is no country where I am Pope except the United States. And when he said this, he undoubtedly cherished the idea which filled the mind of Dr. O. A. Brownson when he penned these extraordinary sentiments. That is, that popular liberty in its true sense can only exist where the people are reduced to a condition of political vassalage and where there is a power superior to them, with authority sufficient to command and to govern them. With both of them, as well as with many Roman Catholic writers who have similarly expressed themselves, such sentiments grew out of the existing condition of the nations and the decaying fortunes of the papacy. In all the countries professedly Roman Catholic, the church has restricted and hampered in what were asserted to be its rights on account of its close alliance with despotism, while in this country, owing to the liberality of our institutions, it is, that is, the Roman Catholic Church is legally free and is left without the interference of the law to the uninterrupted pursuit of its ecclesiastical policy. In other words, out of all the nations of the world, there's only one nation in the world that allows the Roman Catholic Church to operate and to fulfill its self-proclaimed destiny of world supremacy. That is the United States of America. Now it says, manifestly, it is because the nations of Europe, hitherto Roman Catholic, have taken away from the quote-unquote vicar of God the power to subordinate the laws of the state to the canon laws of the Roman Catholic Church, which have been constructed with sole reference to papal supremacy, that the hope of rebuilding this power in the United States has been excited. What, what did he just say? He said, all the, all the nations of Europe, having long been oppressed by the papal system, threw off the authority of the papacy. And the papacy had only one place left in the world where it could rebuild its empire, and that is in the free country, where he had the freedom to do so. Having been outlawed in all the nations of Europe, there was one nation left on the planet where the papacy had the freedom to rebuild its dynasty right here in Protestant USA. It said, Paralleled by, uh, excuse me, paralyzed by the defensive policy of the nations where the oppressive character of the papal system has long been observed and, uh, and understood and where its opposition to the rights of the people has been most keenly felt, all these representatives of the papacy uh, uh, cultivate the idea in their own minds and are endeavoring to instill it into the minds of their followers 
that they may avail themselves of the tolerance of our institutions to reconstruct their repudiated system of ecclesiastical absolutism in this country. The present Pope, Pope Pius IX, pressed much nearer the wall than did even Gregory XVI, and doubtless flattered at the thought that the bold utterances of Dr. Brownson and others have yet received no popular rebuke. In other words, the people were silent after O.A. Brownson uh, uh, spoke, has allowed the same hope to obtain possession in his mind. When at his command the defenders of the papacy speak of the church as being legally free in the United States, he and they understand it to mean that it is free under our form of government. And I will just interject, a government that they condemn is heretical. They use the freedom of our government to concentrate and vitalize all its efforts and the best faculties of its priesthood to consummate all the ends and objects they aim at. They do not mean that the people here are to be converted to the Roman Catholic faith by free discussion and appeals to reason. These are methods, methods of procedure forbidden to them. But they do mean just what Dr. Brownson has averred, that the Pope, without any human authority, <coughs> excuse me, that the Pope, without any human authority to challenge or arraign him, shall be at liberty to build up a hierarchy irresponsible, in other words, not responsible to the laws enacted by the people, with authority and powers above those of the national and state governments and sufficient to compel passive obedience to all papal decrees and to the canon laws of the Roman Catholic Church in such form as he, with the crown of the Caesars upon his brow, shall promulgate from his papal and imperial city of Rome. That's it. There's the answer. Right there. The papacy found refuge here in the United States under our free institution, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. They abused those freedoms and liberties to build up a papal hierarchy in this country, to get control of this country, and to do what it has done brought the rest of the world to the feet of the Pope through wars. Here, here's another aspect of this that we just read. It was never the goal of the Roman Catholic Church to make you Catholic by proselytizing you. It was always the goal of the Roman Catholic Church to make you Catholic by the civil law. Rome knows if she is left to reason alone, to pr proselytizing alone, she would die in her grave. It's only by force and coercion and deception and control that Rome can successfully make you Catholic even without your acquiescence. And that's precisely what they've done in, the, in America. America is Catholic because Catholic Catholicism got control of our government and imposed upon us Roman Catholic canon law. Dr. O.A. Brownson averred in his essays that the Pope, without any human authority to challenge or to arraign him, shall be at liberty to build up a hierarchy irresponsive, irresponsible to the laws enacted by the people with authority and powers above those of the national and state governments and sufficient to compel passive obedience to all papal decrees and to the canon laws of the Roman Catholic Church in such form as he, with the crown of the Caesars upon his brow, shall promulgate them from his papal and imperial city of Rome. 
That's the aversion of uh, Dr. O.A. Brownson. And I'm telling you, it's facts on the ground today in America. And if you deny this, we'll prove you wrong. Now, these matters are of sufficient import to arrest public attention. In other words, this should get everybody's attention. And it is time that the people of the United States understood the manner in which a foreign-born priesthood, educated for the purpose, are employing the freedom granted to them by our institution, by our Constitution, what they mean when they write and talk about the freedom of their church, and what the end may be if they shall quietly and unresistingly submit to have replanted here the papal imperialism which has been expelled from every enlightened nation in Europe. When a Protestant talks of freedom, he means the self-government of the people in all their civil affairs, when the papal hierarchy talk about freedom, they mean the freedom of the papacy to govern the world through the popes and through themselves and his agents and auxiliaries. And when in this country we speak of liberty of conscience, we mean that every man should be permitted to worship God in his own personal convictions of duty, uh, that his own personal convictions of duty shall dictate. But the papal hierarchy have no such meaning and intend nothing of this sort. With them, liberty of conscience consists merely of, quote, the right to embrace, profess, and practice the Catholic religion. In a Protestant country, not the right to embrace, profess, and practice the Protestant religion in a Roman Catholic country. And why do they not concede this latter right while demanding the former with such steady persistence? The answer with them is always at hand, and when it is expedient to make it, because, quote, unquote, infidelity is, quote, the last logical consequence of Protestantism. And therefore, Protestant, Protestantism being thus opposed to the law of God, that is the law of the Pope, remember this is Roman Catholic intellectuality here, cannot be tolerated or compromised without sin and must be exterminated. Now, if you're having trouble following R.W. Thompson's language, he's simply saying that in the Roman Catholic hierarchical mind, Protestantism is equivalent to infidelity, and it must be exterminated. Now, do you think R.W. Thompson was qualified to become the Secretary of the U.S. Navy to assess the gravest threats to our free institutions in this country? In my opinion, he was astutely trained to be the Secretary of the U.S. Navy because he foresaw 150 years ago the gravest threat to our Protestant way of life, the papacy, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And as we continue reading in this book, you'll understand, as I do, R.W. Thompson should have been born in our day. Now, these ideas are so plainly and emphatically expressed by the Catholic world. Remember, all these sentiments of Brownson's were, were published in a Roman Catholic periodical, The Catholic World of New York, that the article in which they are found entitled The Plea for Liberty of Conscience is well worthy of careful examination and serious reflection while it apologizes for those, uh, to those of its Catholic readers who take offense at its defensive tone. In other words, they're offended that anyone should have to defend the Roman Catholic Church, the one true Church of Jesus Christ, the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic Church. 
It says, as if it were an act of indiscretion to defend the Roman Catholic Church otherwise than by the dogmatic assumption of its exclusiveness and supremacy, it exhausts its ingenuity in the discussion of the question, what constitutes a violation of just and rightful liberty of conscience? To such of its readers as presuppose, quote, the Catholic religion to be the true one, unquote, it addresses this expressive and violent language. Listen to this, quote, Of course, in the last analysis, we must come back upon the fundamental principle that the law of God is supreme and must be obeyed at all hazards, let come what will. No matter what human law, what private interests, what dreadful penalties may stand in the way, God must be obeyed. Conscience must be followed. Duty must be done. The authority of the state must be braved. Human affections must be discarded. Life must be sacrificed when loyalty to truth and to the will of God requires it. Unquote. These sentiments, when uttered, might have seemed comparatively harmless to the casual reader, and they were probably thus considered by many of the uninitiated laymen of the Roman Catholic Church. They are seemingly full of loyalty to the Christian faith, and yet that they were designed to give a covert and latent significance well understood by the priesthood, there can be no reasonable doubt in the view of what was then transpiring in Rome. Preparations were in the making for the decree of papal infallibility, and it was doubtless considered necessary by such utterances as these to put the minds of the faithful Roman Catholics in a fit condition to accept without murmur this radical change in the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. At that time, papal infallibility was no less a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church than it is now, but it was differently deposited. It was the infallibility of the Church when acting through and by means of the representative authorities it has recognized for centuries, that is, councils and popes conjointly. Whatever opinions contrary to this may have been expressed elsewhere and have generally prevailed among the hierarchy, this was undoubtedly the belief of a very large majority of the lay members of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. They both felt and expressed for the Pope a feeling bordering upon reverence, but had never yet been brought to the point of accepting him as possessed alone of all the infallibility that they had been accustomed to assign to the church. In other words, they had never consented to accept a church organization entirely deprived of all ordinary representative features. With them, the old faith was sanctified by centuries of time, and they associated all ideas of invasion upon it with heretical teachings. Feeling assured that a deposit thus sacred would be preserved with fidelity by its custodians, and having no dread of any antagonism to it from within, they exhibited their, con their confidence by the most deferential obedience. Whatsoever came to them with the stamp of authority was willfully accepted, but they had not yet learned to regard this authority, insofar as it affected the fundamentals of their faith, as lodged elsewhere than in the collective body of their bishops, acting conjointly with the Pope in the general councils of the whole church. Any accusation that they did so usually excited their resentment, at all events their unqualified denial. And when this is taken into account, when it is considered how few there were who pretended to believe the doctrine of papal infallibility, it may well be supposed that these avowals of the Catholic world passed unobserved by the ordinary reader at the time. Although the article may have been read by many Roman Catholic laymen, 
it is not probable that they perceived its ultimate bearing or design. Or if they did, they did not suppose it possible that any harm could be done by it to the theory of popular government, so long as the faith and doctrines of their church were subject to interpretation only by the whole body of the episcopate, gathered together in general conference. Uh, general counsel from all parts, parts of the world and representing the entire church. This view of it would have naturally arisen in the minds of the most honest and unsuspecting members of the church, of that large class who are made credulous by the excess of their fidelity and who are no more inclined to suspect others of duplicity than they are to practice it themselves. Yet it cannot now be seriously denied that the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, or those among them who occupied the most commanding and influential positions, fully understood the import and meaning of the principles of church polity so boldly pro proclaimed by the Catholic world. In other words, it completely escaped, generally speaking, it completely escaped the the. the in other words, it went right over the heads of the general Catholic laity. But the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this, under, in this country fully understood the import of what was being said by Brownson and by what was done in, in, with the papal infallibility. The people didn't comprehend or suspect that their Roman Catholic Church was simply declaring the very government that the Roman Catholic laity enjoyed in this country, that that government was heretical, and that they, lo they owed their loyalty to the papacy and the papacy alone, that all the honor and, and feely, filial uh, feelings that they had for their Roman Catholic Church was now taken from the church and put right into the very person of the papacy, and that what he stood for was divine right rule, and that their duty now was not to enjoy the free institutions of the United States and the Constitution, which the Pope now declares as heretical, but to help to overthrow that government and to make the Pope their divine right ruler. All of this escaped the casual reader, but the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the foreign-born and educated priests in this country, did understand the full import of what was being said in the Catholic world. Now the prelates and the priests knew that they were expressed in response to the Pope's encyclical and syllabus of 1864, we're talking about Pope Pius IX, where he damned our form of government as heresy. He said the prelates and the priests knew that they were expressed in response to the Pope's encyclical and syllabus of 1864 in order to prepare the whole membership of the Roman Catholic Church gradually but cautiously for the decree of papal infallibility. First came the encyclical and syllabus of error that damned our form of government, our, all of our free institution. It literally damned Protestantism because our form of government grew out of the Protestant mind. And all of that was simply in preparation for the ultimate goal, and that was to name the papacy the divine right ruler, not only of the church, but of every government, and even the divine interpreter of the natural law. The prelates and the priests knew that they, these sentiments were expressed in response to the Pope's encyclical and syllabus of 1864 in order to prepare the whole membership of the Roman Catholic Church gradually and cautiously for the decree of papal infallibility 
for the ultimate concentration of all the authority of the Roman Catholic Church in the hands of the Pope alone at the expense of the representative feature in the church economy and for the substitution of his orders, decrees, and commands for such as hitherto, uh, heretofore for over 1,800 years, except when papal usurpation made it otherwise, have been considered the law of the church when proceeding from the whole body of the church. In other words, they were going to rebuild the church. They're going to rebuild it from the top down. And they're going to invest all the power in the Pope. They say Rome never changes. The, the author points out that papal infallibility was always inherent in the belief, but that was expressed, that infallibility was expressed by a conjoint effort by the papacy and the hierarchy, known as the church. But now, all power is vested in the Pope. It says, in no other sense can these principles be now interpreted. Indeed, the Catholic world did not, at the time of their utterance, intend to leave much doubt about its meaning in the minds of the initiated, the priests. It intended to place itself in advance of others who were slower to move in the direction indicated by the Pope. Therefore, with the encyclical and syllabus to dictate the sentiments, it was announced at the next number that the Pope, quote, as the head and mouthpiece of the Roman Catholic Church, administers its discipline and issues orders to which every Catholic, under pain of sin, must yield obedience, unquote. These are not loose and idle sayings, nor are they expressed by ignorant and irresponsible men. The Catholic world is edited with great ability and possesses very high literary merit. It is issued from the Catholic Publication House in New York, manifestly the Episcopal sanction. And, with, and when such a publication with such high endorsement solemnly and under, and under all responsibilities announces it as a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that disobedience to the orders of the Pope is sin against God, what should interest the American people more than to inquire whether it is contemplated or is even possible that any of these orders should be directed against and shall threaten the existence of any of the principles which enter into the structure of their government? The question to be asked is, what does papal infallibility, the decree of papal infallibility have concerning the relationship of Roman Catholic citizens and our government. How is this going to affect them as citizens? Will they continue to be loyal Americans, loyal to the Constitution, help to defend our, our nation and our Constitution and way of life against papal tyranny? This is the question that should be asked today of every Roman Catholic. Are you first an American, or are you first a papist? Because if you're a papist, if you're a true papist, you must be diametrically opposed to our democratic, and I dare say Protestant, way of life. You are just as anti-American as your pope. The only loyalty that the papacy has to the American government is to take advantage of its free institutions so it can rebuild its Antichrist dynasty and impose it upon the rest of the world. And what part do you play in that, Mr. Roman Catholic? What part do you play in that, Mr. President, Mr. Congressman and wo Congressman and Congresswoman? What part do you play in that, Mrs. or Mr. Supreme Court Justice? What part do you play in that, Mr. Mayor? 
you Roman Catholic? Are you an American? Or are you a papist? Who do you serve? Do you serve Christ? Or do you serve Antichrist? That is the question that needs to be asked by every American. First, we have to examine ourselves. Do we serve Christ or Antichrist? And then legitimately, we can ask every Roman Catholic in this country, who do you serve, Christ or Antichrist? The people of the United States are completely ignorant as to who really runs this country and how he does it. No one dare ask the question for fear of starting a religious war. Well, I'm telling you, the war is coming, and it's coming against God's people. Because Antichrist rules this country, and he rules it through his people in this country. And they concentrate all of their authority in Washington, D.C., on the Supreme Court, in the White House, in Congress, in the banks, in the churches in the ecumenical evangelical belly churches. Do you feel the pressure of an oppressive government? After having read just this little dab so far in the papacy and the civil power, you've got to know that if papacy ever gets control in this country, you'll be Roman Catholic by force. The government will enforce Roman Catholic by simply adopting Roman Catholic canon law and whittling away at your Protestant Constitution. And that's precisely what's happening. No one will speak about it in those terms. And I dare say many of the hosts, even on, on First Amendment Radio and LibertyRadioLive.com, won't come out and say precisely who it is. Well, they'll talk about the rich ruling elite. They'll talk about the they and them and the power elite, they'll never once mention the most powerful and elite on the earth, the Pope of Rome, as does R.W. Thompson. Oh, they'll talk about the Rothschilds, but they'll never tell you that they're the guardians of the Vatican Treasury. They'll talk about the Rockefellers, but they'll never tell you they're Knights of Malta. We've got all of these experts that draw all of the attention on Internet and alternative radio, very entertaining programs, full of fear-mongering and conspiracy theories, name-droppers, but they never give you that key piece of, it, of, of information. R.W. Thompson goes right to the heart of the matter, the papacy. And that's where Inquisition Update goes, right to the heart of the matter. We don't just nibble around the edges to entertain people. Go right to the heart of the matter, the papacy. The author continues, as the prosecution of this inquiry progresses, much will appear well calculated to startle those whose advoca uh, avocations lead them into other fields of thought and investigation. In the light of the teachings thus far announced, and of the further fact that the Pope's infallibility is almost universally recognized in the United States, either by open approval or silent acquiescence. There's, there it is, silent acquiescence. If you don't speak out against papal infallibility, it is a, automatically assumed that you accept papal infallibility and papal control of every aspect of your life. And that defines the United States of America. That even defines the Protestant churches. Silent acquiescence. We just don't want to rock the boat. We just don't want to have problems with our Christian Catholic brothers 
and therein lies the error. We'll focus closer tomorrow on the broadcast. You've been listening to Inquisition Update.